All right. Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, my name is Danny Williams, and today you guys are tuning in to Heatsink 201. Uh, I want to let everybody know right away that uh, this webinar is actually through a uh, going to be broadcast through your computer speakers. So if you have called in right now, what I would highly recommend is making sure that your computer speakers are not muted, and you will be able to hear everything that is being uh, discussed. Also, I wanted to let you guys know that there is a questions box, so at any point, if you guys have any concerns or questions that you would like to ask, please feel free to submit those, and we will be addressing them at the end of today's discussion with Richard Dazaki. So without further ado, or actually, I'm going to give you guys maybe like 30 seconds to hopefully make that transition so that your uh, computer speakers are working. We'll go ahead and start. Thank you and welcome to Heatsink 201, where we will learn even more about heatsink design. Before we discuss new topics with 201, I wanted to go back and review some of the things we talked about in Heatsink 101. In Heatsink 101, we started by just asking ourselves what a heatsink was. We see various heatsinks here. They come in different shapes and sizes, all with pros and cons. My definition of the purpose of a heatsink is to allow for more efficient heat transfer from a heat source to the surrounding fluid environment. And by more efficient, I mean a lower temperature difference. We started looking at the heat sink heat transfer methods. Uh, the first one being conduction. Heat can conduct from the die through the lid and interface material up into the base and fins. From there, it's going to convect and radiate away into the environment. We introduced the idea of a thermal budget, where we represent it with a 1D thermal resistance. We're neglecting any kind of 3D effect, which there are plenty of. But for this, this is a common approach to help kind of size heat sinks, see how effective an interface material needs to be to meet the temperature requirements. So here we have the junction to case thermal resistance, RJC, the case to sink, which would be the interface material thermal resistance and the thermal resistance associated with the heat sink, which I call sink to ambient thermal resistance. We also introduced a way to categorize the different heat sink design criteria with uh, first at the device level. Some important factors would be the component power dissipation, the maximum allowed junction temperature, the mounting system or, and or interface material that's going to be used, and the IC package style. Some IC packages are more efficient at conducting heat out the top of the package, some at the bottom. There's also some system level design criteria. How much space do you have for the heat sink? The operating environment, what's the surrounding temperature and elevation? Do we have natural or forced convection? And is this have ducted flow or is it uh, allow for flow bypass? And then there's the kind of non-thermal practical constraints where the heat sink we design has to be manufactured at a reasonable cost, and some heat sinks and mounting methods may be more reliable than others. We also introduced a couple heat sink calculations, one for heat transfer coefficient, and the other one for kind of the minimum gap size between fins. And these are good equations for initial sizing or estimating for a given velocity, what kind of heat transfer you're going to get, and for the length of the heat sink, and how many fins should you have. We're going to look at bypass, but as you add more fins, you're going to get more bypass around there. The velocity of the fins will drop. So anyway, we're going to talk about that in more detail today. And we also showed a application example based on the Karma board where we did a modular heat sink design. And today we're going to be looking at the same board, but with a monolithic heat sink design. So we'll compare the results of those. So today's new topics are going to be essentially around heat sink design considerations. First, we're going to look at thermal conductivity. Thermal conductivity, the conduction aspect of the heat sink is very important and the convection is important, and the radiation, but for the most part, I'm going to focus on conduction and convection. And they're interdependent on each other, so one affects the other. 
So anyway, we'll thermal conductivity start. And then we'll look at ducted and bypass flow and look at the difference in terms of what would be the optimal heat sink and some of the specific aspects of the flow. And after that, we're going to talk about heat sink characterization. So kind of what's the methodology used to characterize a heat sink and what can you do with that information? And then I'm going to show an optimization where the primary focus is on varying the heat sink width and length of the heat sink to look at its effect on thermal resistance. And like I said, we have the camera board application example again, where I'm showing one of the monolithic heat sinks that we'll take a look at. So heat sink thermal conductivity. How important is thermal conductivity? Well, it depends. Like most answers in heat transfer, the answer is it depends. And we're going to not cover everything about thermal conductivity today, but one aspect of it. So we're going to consider an example where we have a component on a PCB in flow therm. And then we're going to add a heat sink to that component and vary the thermal conductivity of the heat sink. We're going to vary it from thermally conductive plastic to aluminum. And we're going to look at that in both free convection and forced convection environments. So I set these models up in flow therm, and here are the results. So on the vertical axis, I have sink to ambient thermal resistance, horizontal axis, the thermal conductivity of the heat sink, and over to the right are some dimensions of the heat sink. We can see each line represents a different kind of flow condition, blue free convection or natural convection, and the way I want one meter per second is orange, and then gray is two meters per second. But we can see that there's really little drop off on thermal performance when we go from, say, a conductivity of 200, like aluminum, all the way down to, say, 25. So it, the conductivity doesn't seem to have an effect, or it's the thermal resistance through conduction is kind of being dominated by convection and isn't really a factor until it gets very low. So I, I looked at these results a different way and just looked at the percent change in thermal resistance rather than the absolute values. So I started at you know, conductivity 200, so that would be 0% change. And as we lower conductivity to the left, we can see what its percent change is. And I've identified where this would be a, like a conductivity of 3. So I'm saying thermally conductive plastics, plastic, I'm going to say it's 3 watts per meter K, uh, 5 and 10. So we can see for forced convection, the low conductivity, you know, you have a 40% change in thermal resistance. Where in free convection, maybe it's 11 or 12% at the lowest conductivity. So free convection, you know, the convective heat transfer and the thermal resistance associated with that is much larger than that of the conductivity. So, you know, for natural convection applications, there really isn't a huge benefit in using, say, aluminum over a material that has a much lower conductivity. Not thermally speaking, but until prices come down on other materials, then aluminum is the choice that is made. But it's not purely based on a thermal reason for these cases. Now, later on in future webinars, we'll continue to talk about conductivity. So this is just one aspect of thermal conductivity. Next thing I'd like to talk about is ducted versus bypass flow. So what is bypass and how does it affect the optimal design? So we have ducted. With ducting the air, is forced between the fins, so more fins result in a higher flow impedance across the heat sink. With bypass adding fins, forces more air to go around the heat sink, so less flow passes through the fins. So that's what we're talking about, ducted versus bypass. As the number of fins increase, the air velocity within the fins decrease when we have bypass flow. And we see for the case on the left with eight fins, we essentially have the same velocity within the fin gaps as we do as the approach velocity. Adding 12, the velocity goes down. We could start to see it really blocking the flow downstream. By the time we get up to 15 fins, it's really blocking the flow quite a bit. Now, we don't necessarily, just the higher velocity doesn't mean that's the, the best heat sink. We'll see later that this is actually the best heat sink. So it's a balance between the airspeed in the fins and the surface area, and that's really you know, why CFD is great. You can analyze that sort of stuff. 
If you don't have CFD, a good way or an initial way to estimate it is uh, there's a good article on the Electronics Cooling Magazine by Robert Simmons, the Estimate the Effect of Flow of Bypass on Parallel Plate Thin Heat Sink Performance. And if you look at this site, you'll get equations on how to estimate the velocity. So that combined with the equations that we previously introduced, you could estimate the heat sink thermal resistance. He's done that. He's plotting it here. You see this lower line is with outflow bypass. So we see it, it has an optimum, but a higher number of fins than the condition with bypass. And as you go away from the optimum, the curve is less steep than it is when you have bypass. So that's kind of interesting. I ran the same type of situation in flow therm, where I have basically the heat sinks we saw a couple slides ago, where I look at the thermal resistance when it's ducted, this blue line, and then with bypass, this orange line, both at uh, two meters per second. So I'm seeing the same type of effect as the uh, previous table showed, the previous chart, where with bypass, you know, there's more pronounced optimum. With ducted, the optimum is a higher fin count Lower thermal resistance, yeah, certainly the, the velocity is going to be higher in the fins. And departure from the optimum is much less steep. So you got to look at pressure drop when you're talking about ducted flow. So we could see the pressure for these different fin counts increases linearly with uh, increased number of fins. For the bypass case, really there's no, no effect on the pressure drop as the air just... Rather than increasing the pressure, the air just moves around the heat sink. So there's a price to pay. So really, when you look at a ducted system, you don't have the opportunity to fix the velocity. You have something driving that flow, like a, a fan that has some kind of uh, characteristic curve. So let's take a look at that. So I analyzed the model in flow therm with, rather than fixing the F-stream velocity, I use it with a fan. So that's the gray curve right here. You see in each chart, I am identifying the optimum with these large circles with the border. We can still see what the optimum is. Anyway, yeah, so we can see that uh, in this case, the bypass versus the fan produced essentially the same thermal resistance as an optimum. Just a coincidence. That's a coincidence. And uh, the optimum number of fins, depending on the fan that you have, could be higher or could be lower than these other values. Because we're talking about ducted flow, I thought it would be a good time to talk about heat sink characterization because that's typically based on a ducted flow environment. So a heat sink characterization provides thermal resistance and pressure drop versus approach velocity for the heat sink. You know, and this is something that vendors would provide for heat sinks that are used in a forced convection environment. Vendors will typically fit the wind tunnel cross section to the heat sink with very little bypass. So there's they limit the room for the air to go above the heat sink or around the sides of the heat sink. And they would also typically mount the heat sink so the base is flush with the wind tunnel floor. So the flow is as uniform as possible coming across this heat sink. And lastly, they're going to apply the heat uniformly because any kind of heat spreading through the base is going to give higher effective thermal resistance to that heat sink. I was asked after Heat Sink 101, is there any standard? And I'm not aware of any standard for heat sink characterization, but vendors generally pour data based on the same, same measurement environment. So they're all very similar that way, I believe. Metrics are provided for comparative purposes and are not typically used directly in a design. So the way this test environment is going to be different than your system environment could help you compare heat sinks from different vendors. See, look at the pressure drop versus an applied flow rate and the resultant thermal resistance before you go to the next step. Just to take a look at that, the air flow in the characterization environment is different than the system. So the air flow in the measurement environment, you know, is going to be nice and uniform. But when we go to system flow, and this is that heat sink and bypass, we could see that the air can leave the top of the heat sink, and also we've got a bunch of recirculation going down at the back end. Quite different. So this environment's going to give you a different performance than the measurement environment. So be careful. It's great data for the vendors to provide it, but 
you can't just design only with that data is the point I'm trying to make. So if you did have a ducted system and you had a fan, how would you estimate the performance of that system? So we have our thermal heatsink characterization information, the thermal resistance versus approach velocity, and the pressure drop of that heatsink versus approach velocity. And I've also plotted the fan curve. So this would all be, you know, say vendor provided data. So we identify the intersection of this pressure drop curve and the fan curve. Then we go vertically upwards till we intersect that thermal resistance curve and then over, and then we can estimate the thermal resistance of the heat sink in that system. Again, it would just be an estimate to get you in the ballpark of where you need to be. Okay, the next thing I'd like to discuss is heat sink width versus length optimization and what is more important. You probably already know the answer to this, but it's interesting to look at, I think. So there's a heat sink. What is more important, the heat sink width or the heat sink length? I used Flowtherm to study this. I set up a design of experiments. In this image here, we're seeing what the base case heat sink looked like. So what I'm varying in this design of experiments is heat sink length, so 33 millimeters to 99, so I'm showing 33, so it's allowed to go 3x. The heat sink will always stay centered on the component. And I'm varying the number of fins, so rather than varying the fin width directly, I'm varying the number of fins, and then I set up a linear constraint in command center so that I can maintain the constant fin gap. I felt like this would give me a better one-to-one -one comparison of length versus width, but I just want to point out that this really isn't a width optimization. It's more of a study, but I'm using design of experiments, and then I, I do some optimization also, but uh, anyway, I just want to make that point. I also included base thickness, so I allow the base thickness to go for anywhere between 3 and 5 millimeters. So the fin height changes with the base thickness to maintain the CP same heat sink height. So I think that's probably a natural way to do any kind of uh, optimization in many cases because you have a specific volume and lots of times it's a balance between fin area and base thickness, especially as the heat sinks become oversized and there's a spreading resistance through the base. We talked a little bit about heat spreading in um, Heat Sink 101, but that'll be a focus uh, on the next webinar. For now, we're going to look at this. Constant height heat sink. 30 designs were simulated, and all I'm trying to show you here is the distribution of the design of experiments. So we try and get equal coverage for each variable in that design space. Lots of runs here. And then the output I have is junction temperature and heat sink mass. Again, the, the thing I want to illustrate here is that I was easily able to create a lot of models and solve them. It was easy to generate a lot of results. But the difficult part is trying to interpret these results and know what is better and what is worse. That's where the optimization comes in. So I used response surface optimization, which takes the results of the design ex of experiments, and it does two things. First, mathematically, it tries to estimate where the optimum is. So what's the optimum width and length and base thickness? But it also gives you the plots and data to study the sensitivity of these design inputs, which I think are just as valuable, really, as the actual optimum. So anyway, with that one set of design of experiment results, I did two optimizations. The first one was to minimize the heatsink mass whilst attempting to maintain junction temperature below 95 degrees C. The second optimization was to minimize the junction temperature. So here's the results of optimization one. So to minimize the mass, the optimization decided that it didn't need to grow the length. So the heat sink length is the minimum value in my design space. The maximum number of fins I could have is 36. So this heat sink isn't the full width that's, that's possible. But it did grow the width until it satisfied this 95 degree C target. And then also chose the thinnest base thickness, again, because it was trying to minimize the mass. One point I'll make here is that the cost function was to minimize the mass. There was an output constraint to hit this 95C. 
So when I ran the CFD results, so I took the, the estimated, the output of the estimated optimum, ran it with CFD, this was the actual junction temperature. But I just wanted to point out that this junction temperature wasn't the cost function. So slight difference there. For the second optimization, I wanted to minimize the junction temperature. So in this case, it went the full width allowed with 36 bends, it went the full base thickness, and then grew the heat sink length to 82 and a half millimeters, where 99 millimeters was the maximum that could have gone to. So going beyond 82 and a half wasn't going to benefit the heat sink performance because of the air being allowed to bypass, so it cut it off 82 and a half. The minimum temperature was 76 and a half degrees, about 20 degrees less than the, the one we're trying to minimize the, the junction, I'm sorry, minimize the mass. But then I thought, what if these heat sinks are made out of copper? What kind of performance would we get then? If the heat sinks were copper instead of aluminum, for optimization one, the temperature drops about seven degrees and only about four and a half degrees in optimization two. I was kind of surprised a little bit. I thought that I might get better performance increase with the higher conductivity material. In this case, it doesn't really warrant the, you know, over 3x increase in heat sink mass, probably. That was kind of the one output from the response surface optimization. What are the optimums? The other aspect is trying to study the effect of the input parameters. So I took the data from the response surface optimization and created these two plots. So on the horizontal axis here, we have the increase in heat sink dimension. So the x, one and a half times the initial length or width, two times, two and a half times, and so on. This orange line is the heat sink length. So you see, certainly before I get to 2x, the benefit of increasing the length is uh, there's no additional benefit. And the total benefit, you know, doesn't increase beyond 10%. Width... You know, I have much larger benefit in going with width, but it's not linear. I believe that if this heat sink were a perfect conductor, that this heat sink width would probably be a linear variation. Let me know if you disagree or have other ideas, and we can explore them and, and write about it. Anyway, so I think, you know, this effect in large part is due to the heat spreading through the base and how, as these fins get further and further away from the heat source because of the inefficiencies in conduction, I don't get the same benefit as if they're closer. So interesting, I think. As we probably knew beforehand, width, more important than length. But this just kind of illustrates it. So onto the application example. So this is the Karma board thermal design used in the Owen Valley Radio Observatory at the California Institute of Technology. Just to review some of the particulars of this example, we have the flow direction is from bottom to top. All the components are dissipating 13 watts, not very high power really. So it shouldn't require any too aggressive of a heat sink solution. TJ Maxx, 95 degrees, in an ambient of 35. Again, kind of relaxed constraints there. It did have one interesting constraint where to try and maintain these component temperatures within 5 degrees C of each other. And that is to do with the operation of the board, the timing of these ICs. And we see the interface material is 1 degree C in squared per watt. Um, in the previous example, I used the same interface material because... It's, it's low power, doesn't really require anything too exotic for interface. But with monolithic heat sinks, typically you know you're going to be required to have an interface material that can compensate for the tolerance in the component heights and, and make sure that this heat sink seats properly on all the components. So I think an interface material resistance of one is probably a reasonable assumption. To just review the results out of the Heatsink 101 uh, design optimization, this is the Heatsink dimensions fin heights for this modular Heatsink design. And the design setting and optimization was very, was almost uh, all those components are exactly the same temperature. So it worked well, but many people pointed out during the webinar and after that monolithic heat sinks are uh, great 
choice when trying to maintain components at the same temperature. And I agree, connecting components through conduction is a great way to make the hotter component cooler and the cooler component hotter, bringing them together, and then convect the heat away at the same time. So anyway, it's a good, good choice. We considered three designs. The first one I'm calling it radial, and this is based on a, a sketch on a napkin, and I'll explain the theory why uh, someone thought this might be a good idea, and it turned out it wasn't a bad idea, actually. Probably not good enough to warrant the additional costs required probably to make that heat sink. The second thing we looked at is just the plate fin heat sink, and third, we looked at that same heat sink but with some cross cuts that are strategically located. They're not uniform. Let's just say they're not uniform. They're placed there for other reasons besides uniformity. Anyway, we want to look at this because coming out of Heatsink 101, people were asking, rightfully, that uh, as flow moves down a channel, get to fully developed flow, and if we can have a cross cut to both maybe introduce some cooler air and also to reform the boundary layer, would we get more efficient heat transfer? We did a Q&A paper for Heatsink 101 afterwards where we kind of explored this idea where the sacrifice in surface area for convection, you know, you don't get something for nothing. So losing a little bit of surface area wasn't compensated for by any additional cross cuts. And that's, you know, what we said was generally true. When we're looking at these things, I want to see like a, uh, what I would say a sledgehammer. So if I see a, say, one degree difference in a 30 degree temperature rise, I'm not sure I'm going to spend a lot of time optimizing around that parameter. Anyway, that, that's my opinion. So anyway, these are three heat sinks we looked at. And let's just look at the temperatures. So I have one legend for the plate and cross cut, and then another legend for the radial. It was operating at a higher temperature. Primarily, I believe, because, you know, it's got a lot less surface area we can see here. So a couple things to note. We could see slight differences in the surface temperature of this heat sink, but not greatly. Not maybe enough to warrant an extra step in the manufacturing process of this heat sink. And this probably did not perform well enough to warrant any additional costs in manufacturing. But the idea behind this design was, one nice thing is, it's kind of organically got less surface area upstream than downstream. So, you know, it kind of balances how the heat's going to be rejected because you have more surface area to reject the heat down here. The other idea was that once the air enters the channel, it will accelerate down the channel, providing better convective heat transfer as you move down the channel. The third reason why this was a novel idea, in theory, was that these channels were set up in such a way that cooler air could be introduced on the sides. Now, these fins, you know, are not optimized. You probably have more fins, less fins, different angles, and look at the effect. What we wanted to, to begin with is see, did this initial sketch on a napkin warrant any further investigation? Our decision was that it really didn't, but it doesn't mean it was a bad design. It's just that it's probably going to be hard to improve over this base performance. As far as junction temperatures, the radial is higher than the plate and cross cut, but it's, it's the one that matched the five degree delta T more closely. You know, for this example, in this design, it uh, would probably satisfy the constraints of the design. Where these don't, I mean, they're well below the maximum operating limit, but there's about a 10 degree delta between the uh, forward and rear components. But I think that could be easily, you know, compensated for by having a, a thicker base. So again, let's Let's use that uh, connection through the conduction process between these components and improve it by giving it more cross-sectional area to conduct heat through. So I think that uh, could be taken care of. And also, if we compare the junction temperatures between the plate and cross-cut, we'll see there really is no significant difference. So some concluding remarks. Heat sinks are not as simple as they look. 
there are many times, and most of the things I've looked at are kind of simple extrusions, uh, which seem simple, and convection, conduction, radiation certainly aren't complicated topics, really. But they, they aren't as simple as uh, some correlations and a surface area. The correlations shown are useful for some initial sizing and studying of the trends between some design choices, like ducted versus bypass, more fins versus less fins, uh, heat sink length versus heat sink width. But you certainly wouldn't want to base your final design on correlations, I don't believe. Not, not today. And performance metrics are best used for comparative purposes. So while the vendor provided data is valuable, it's difficult to be able to take that, like any performance metric data, component level, heat sink level, fan level, it's difficult to know exactly how that's going to perform once you place that in your system. Heat sinks, I believe, are especially true. Heat sinks are best designed for a specific system. And I'm going back to what we were just talking about. You can look at the characterization data, but really not have a great idea how it's going to perform in your system. We see a strong interaction between the heat sink and the surrounding flow. It's going to affect its performance. And we looked at an example where conduction and convection are interdependent. So it's best studied all at the same time in the system environment. My recommendation, you know, design the heatsink in situ, ideally with CFD. Do some initial sizing, like, hey, can we cool this component with this much space? Correlations would be great for that, I think. You know, yeah, it looks like we could do that in terms of designing that. I would use CFD, and in terms of validating the design, certainly you want to use measurement. All right, and there is one last thing I want to share with you guys. So now that we have completed uh, today's webinar, uh, we I just want to show you guys this screen so that if you have any additional uh, questions or want more information, please feel free to call this number or email us at the email address on the screen. Uh, we also had a question during today's webinar, if it's possible to view the recording of the previous webinar, specifically Heatsink 101. And the answer to that is yes, you can actually navigate to our YouTube channel through that website. It will be on there later today. Uh, we also send out uh, an email notification after our webinars because our webinars are recorded uh, with a notification that you guys can watch the recording after the fact as well. Um, so we also have a couple questions to go over additional to that, that uh, Richard Izaki is going to be helping us with. So Richard, are you there? Uh, yeah. Hi, Danny. Hi. All right. So one of our, the first questions that we got today was, how has 3D printing changed how heat sink ducting is implemented? Ducting. Yeah, sure. So historically, ducting for heat sinks has either been just simple sheet metal that's folded into shape and kind of forces the air through a heat sink, or maybe it's just a plastic, again, just folded. Uh, I guess with 3D printing, you can, you know, create more exotic shapes, uh, you know, to really optimize the airflow into a heat sink, maybe do some branching or splitting or something like that. You're just not limited to those Cartesian folds uh, that, that you typically have to work with with sheet metal. So, so that's definitely a benefit. Um, a downside is uh, you can't we can't really go scale with 3D printing yet. It's, it's just too slow. So um, I think there's uh, the, the space we can research that, but uh, not really uh, practical for, for large scale uh, implementation as of yet. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for explaining that. Uh, so the second question we have is, what's the best way to characterize the performance of a, custom, a customized heatsink? So if a heatsink has been customized, uh, I'm assuming you mean maybe uh, it's not just a simple extrusion, right? So some of the heat sinks we looked at today were just, just aluminum extrusions that were cut to size. If something was customized, maybe, you know, you've got uh, custom fin pitches, a bit like that radial one, um, then you'd probably want to put that in a standardized wind tunnel test chamber, you know, m making sure that you set the, the sizes above and to the sides of the heat sink so they're consistent across your, your, your heat sink and then you know um, 
testing that in a wind tunnel type environment. I mean, ideally you want to uh, place it in situ on your actual design, but if you're looking to compare custom heat sinks, then that, that's probably the best way to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, does anodizing the heat sink make any difference? Uh, interesting. So I would say most of the time anodization is used more for aesthetic purposes, you know, nice blue or a purple heat sink uh, that you can achieve with, with anodizing. Uh, on the overall performance, uh, the answer is no. It, it might change your radiative heat transfer a couple of percent either way, but, but on the whole, you know, heat sinks uh, perform best with conduction and convection and, and anodization doesn't really do anything for that. Gotcha. All right, and the last question is, where should thermocouples be placed for heat sink temperature measurement? Yes, sure. So if you're doing empirical tests, um, a lot of the time people use uh, thermocouples to measure uh, spot temperatures. Um, so the thing with heat sinks is you, you're going to have like quite a wide variation of temperature across that heat sink. The tips of the fins are going to be much cooler than the center of the base, right? So where do you actually measure? Um, so normally you want the hottest temperature on the heat sink. That would be right in the center above the chip. Uh, touching the heat sink. Um, practically, however, you know, you can't really place a thermocouple there because it's obviously attaching to the component. So, uh, and the other downside is obviously that's going to actually affect the performance of the heat sink if you put a thermocouple there. So I, I've seen people put uh, thermocouples sort of close to the base, actually between the fins, so on the top side. I've even seen companies actually drill down into the heat sink and kind of pot a, uh, a thermocouple into the base as well. So realistically speaking, you want it as close to the heat source without actually affecting the heat sink performance, which is a tricky thing to balance. Sounds like it. Okay, well, that's all the questions that we got today. Um, if anybody else has any more additional questions after the fact, again, please feel free to give us a call or shoot us an email. We'll be happy to help you, whether that's going to be just giving you guys extra information or answer any general questions. Um, but thank you very much for helping us today, Richard. And you guys should all be seeing an email notification soon about uh, the recording of today's webinar. And stay tuned for an upcoming one in a couple weeks.